Hello everyone and welcome to the first ever Sustainable Earth webinar series. I'm Kelly Saunders, Program Manager at Arizona State University's Rob and Melanie Walton Sustainability Solutions Service. At the Solutions Service, we work with external partners to inform strategies that advance sustainability out into the world. I'm really excited today to be your co-host for this webinar. At this time, I'd like to welcome my colleague and co-host, Emma Hobson. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Hobson, and I am a program manager in the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory here at ASU. And I have the distinct pleasure of working with Wells Fargo to create Sustainable Earth. It's a web portal designed to engage audiences of all ages with tools and education to be more sustainable where you live, work, and play. Following today's session, you will be able to find a recording of today's conversation on the sustainable-earth.org webpage. Today's topic of discussion is sustainable purchasing power and practice. It's moderated by Eric Barron, Senior Director of Marketing at the Sustainable Sustainability Consortium, where she works with members and the sustainability community in general on social and environmental impacts on consumer products. Erica, I'm gonna kick it over to you for a welcome and introduction of your panel. Hi, Emma and Kelly. Thank you so much for introducing me again. I'm Erica Farron. I'm the Senior Director Senior Director of Marketing, Communication, and Development for the Sustainability Consortium. And I'm going to share some slides here and we're going to let our other panelists introduce themselves. Let me share this. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, Renee, you want to introduce yourself and then we'll follow by Catherine? Sure. So, hi, everyone. My name is Renee Eddy. Um, I'm currently a bakery category manager for Fresh Time Market. Um, prior to that, I was a uh, coffee supply chain sustainability expert uh, working with Fairtrade USA. So I have a lot of experience within purchasing and, and uh, supply chain sustainability. Thanks, Renee. And Catherine? Ah, my, okay. It's working now, my video? Sorry. Hi, yes. I'm Catherine Bissell Cordova. I'm executive director of Chicago Fairtrade. I'll explain what that is in a little bit, but um. And Renee serves on our board and invited me to be part of this today. So thank you very much. Well, Renee and Catherine, we're so thrilled to have you. Really looking forward to our discussion. And again, uh, for those of you in attendance, if you have questions uh, while we're presenting or even after we're presenting, please put them in the chat. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. So uh, to kick this off, I'm gonna, just going to go through a quick description of what the Sustainability Consortium is and what we do. And uh, why we care about certifications. And if you're unfamiliar with us, uh, we are a nonprofit research program that sits under ASU. We're in the Global Futures Laboratory. And we also um, have staff over at the University of Arkansas and at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So uh, we are mostly university staff working on a great mission together. So again, we're a global organization of diverse stakeholders and we work together uh, to use the best sustainability science that these universities have to offer to help companies make the everyday products we use better and more sustainable. So we were founded about 12 years ago um, after seeing some of the stats that you see here where you see 60% of greenhouse gas emissions and two thirds of deforestation and 80% of water withdrawals are caused by the manufacturing of consumer goods. And so we were really created to help bold, innovative, and measurable change happen just as soon as possible, uh, working with the industry and nonprofits and, and higher ed and academia together. So we realized all those years ago that um, in order to make change and in order to work on climate change issues, you have to incentivize and support manufacturers and their suppliers to adopt new practices and design better products more sustainable products. Now, we wish all companies just did it for the sake of doing it because it's good for the planet and it's good for people, but uh, we know that there are a lot of companies out there that need reasons and incentives to actually change their practices to create uh, more sustainable consumer goods. And there's really a couple different ways that we help do that. Uh, one is we incentivize and show um, cost savings, risk management, those kind of business terms for companies when you adopt sustainable practices, you save money, you create less risk, you make things safer for your staff, all sorts of different things. There's all sorts of reasons why companies can make more sustainable products, but 
the number one pressure which has grown uh, increasingly over the past couple of years is consumers, you, people buying things. Um, everybody notices when you start purchasing one product over another, uh, the salespeople know this. It's the biggest sort of megaphone we all have is in our purchasing power or our non-purchasing power as well. Um, lots of stats uh, talking about why consumer products are becoming more popular with consumers, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I'm mostly showing this slide to show some of the impact areas that we at TSC cover, and a lot of these are through ASU research. Uh, we work on things like system change and agriculture and food systems and ecological impacts, forest, circular economy, which is obviously very popular, and then human and community well-being. So this is a, a little bit of a complicated slide, but um, I'll talk about the theory of change here. So on the left side of your screen um, is basically all the companies that are producing the goods that you buy. So these could be farms, growers, manufacturers, smelters, mines, where, whatever the product is that you're buying from cell phones to food, anything that you buy um, is being made over there on the left side and on the right side is you, the consumer purchasing these things. And in between uh, the companies making these products and you, the people buying them, um, are this the retailer. And so we really work with the left side of the screen to work with suppliers and manufacturers and retailers to not only better commu communicate your sustainability progress, but to basically focus on the sustainability impacts within the supply chain, which ones, if tackled, have the greatest impact. A lot of companies are frozen, they don't know where to start, they don't know what sustainability issue to tackle first, they don't know what makes the most sense. And through the science and research that we do, we sort of help them hone in and figure out what those issues are and how they can tackle them. But again, the right side of the screen, unbelievably more important every single year than when TSC was founded 12 years ago. Consumers are demanding sustainable products, transparent ingredients. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why certifications are so important there. So this is an example of a supply chain that we cover. There's a lot of other research behind it and I took all that out so you can really focus. So this is what we call sweet and savory bakery items. So muffins, those kind of things. So you can see um, on the top left is the farm or the grower where those um, ingredients are grown and then the plant that processes them. So flour, wheat, sugar, all those kind of things. Um, dairy, if you're going to include animal ingredients, and then you've got um, more manufacturing, you've got the preparing and baking and the packaging, you buying them at Starbucks or wherever you're buying them or you're making them at home, uh, eating them, consuming them, and then what you do with the packaging afterwards. So uh, one of the things that TSC focuses on are those little um, orange circles that you see. We've identified um, particular hot spots within the supply chain that have huge sustainability issues. And if you start to measure and track and improve them, they make huge progress for you as a company to make more sustainable products. Um, you can see some of the um, particular sustainability issues we tackle there. So animal welfare, climate and energy, food waste, uh, land and ecosystems and others. You can see according to TSC research, many of the sustainability issues are in the beginning of the supply chain. So where those things are grown in the ground that they're grown on and the people that um, work on those farms and also in the preparing and baking. So in the factories, in the kitchens, those kind of things. So this is just a quick look at some of the work that we do here at TC to help focus. Uh, we help measure, uh, companies measure by using things called KPIs, key performance indicators. So uh, this, for instance, is a question we would ask a company that's producing dairy. And we're asking them, you know, in your organization, how do you manage labor rights risk. So labor rights, you know, on a farm, the people that are working there. Um, and so we get a lot of companies that answer A, we're unable to determine. They have no idea how to measure their labor rights. Those companies are not producing sustainable pro uh, products. They're not really doing anything in the current moment to improve that. However, we see that once companies actually start thinking about it and preparing to manage it, they improve it very quickly. Um, so this is an example of one question that we answer. Usually every category that we ask companies to answer has 15 of these questions. And they're actually quite difficult to answer, but if you can answer them, it means that you're doing what's right and you're doing the right thing for your supply chain. So I'm gonna talk about certifications really quickly and how that all feeds into what uh, I just talked about. So um, 
Certifications can help track many different issues and you as a person, consumer, uh, really should think about what are the issues that you really care about and then identify those certifications. And that way you can recognize them on products that you're thinking about purchasing. Um, a certification to those of us that work in the industry means a lot of things because companies that are certified by some of these labels have done the work and the homework to meet the certification. So we know that they measure at a certain level. Um, there's two examples here, wild caught fish and textiles. This is from our research. So in the wild caught fish category, about 24% of brands that are supplying wild caught fish to wherever you buy them from, Whole Foods, Walmart, anywhere, um, have excellent transparency into their labor rights, meaning that they probably are what's called MSC certified. You'll see that in the middle in the sort of darker blue. Now, MSC certified seafood is very sustainable seafood and the certification is quite rigorous. So companies that can meet that certification have very sustainable seafood for you as a consumer to eat and purchase for your families. It's probably something most consumers don't know about because consumer knowledge on seafood certifications is actually pretty low. And not sure why that is. It's just that they're not quite interested or aware of it yet. Now on the other side of the slide is textiles. And Textiles have all sorts of different certifications um, that you can pay attention to and ones that you've probably heard of. Now, in contrast to wild caught fish, 73% of textile companies have certifications, are aware of specifically their labor rights. And some of that is because consumers are really aware of what's going on in the clothing that they buy and they hold companies accountable. Uh, they're not quite doing that with seafood companies yet, but they will. So if the seafood companies aren't ready yet, uh, they should be because the consumers are going to come for them. So this is all example of how important certifications are and how consumer knowledge of certifications can really push companies to adopt these certifications and put them out there. There's a couple other down at the bottom. There's a lot of different certifications. And I know Renee and, and Catherine are going to sort of cover certifications from their particular point of views. So I'll stop uh, presenting right now and I'm going to throw it to Renee to talk a little bit about what she's working on with certifications. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, let me share this. Hold on just a moment. All right, I'm hoping everyone can see that. If not, someone can send me a little message. Um, but I kind of just wanted to give a little overview of certification. So I think the, the beginning thought of certification is really to think about who benefits from it. So, you know, um, Eric Erica touched on this a little bit, you know, it is starting with the farmers and the workers. So with my experience working with Fair Trade USA, really understanding um, labor issues, maybe it's climate change, um, different factors that go into sourcing from agricultural products. Um, and then the next benefit from certification is going to be certificate holders. So um, whether it's the vendor or the broker, um, any intermediary within the supply chain, um, all the way up to market, market partners and consumers. So I think the big thing to um, first recognize about certification is that it is a way to have a third party verify items within your supply chain. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges and opportunities within a lot of supply chains is traceability and ensuring that the product um, is being traced all the way from the um, where it's grown or where it's produced all the way out to retail um, sale. You know, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of touch on this is, is looking at it from different perspectives. So there's the brand and vendor perspective of really making sure that you're, you know, sourcing from people that have um, great labor support within their agricultural supply chain, or maybe the manufacturer that you're working with in terms of textiles is, you know, has great uh, labor and working conditions. Um, so it gives a lot of brand value. But then I think from the retailer perspective in the work that I'm doing now, um, there's a lot of ways to leverage making decisions about which brands you source and what you choose to carry within your retail location and how that um, really tells your own sustainability story also from the retailer perspective. All right, so I just wanted to give a couple of stats really quick. Um, so this is from 2020 or probably 2019, the research was done, but um, 
you know, sustainable products sell around 5% higher than conventional products in, um, in three key segments. So this is a lot of this is around the food industry, which is where a lot of my focus has been. Um, it was predicted that in 2021, there would be around $150 billion of sustainability, um, sustainability minded sourced goods. Um, and then it's about 64% of more than half of US households actually say that they buy sustainable products, um, which is up four percentage points from, from a year prior. So a couple more stats for you guys about why it's important to consider sustainability and also um, certification within your supply chain. So, you know, I had touched a little bit on consumers earlier. So 19% report when asked um, that sustainability is a really important factor when they're choosing which foods to eat. So Erica touched on that a little bit with seafood. Um, you know, people are really looking to understand where their food came from, um, not only in terms of traceability and location, but also ensuring that workers are treated fairly, um, that the environment is doing well, if it's like in a rain, Rainforest Alliance type certification. Um, so there's different certifications to verify different key uh, 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 ways to evaluate your supply chain. 79% um, of consumers want to know that a company is mindful of its practices and will become loyal customers when they do. So people that purchase with sustainability in mind have a tendency to become loyal, loyal followers and loyal shoppers. So, you know, if that's a commitment to your brand, if you're producing, you know, an item, or if that's a commitment to your um, store and your retail locations, if you're a retailer. So almost half of consumers are more likely to trust a company's claims if they are backed up by proof. And to me, that's one of the biggest um, shout outs to certification, right? So uh, there's a, within the coffee industry, there's a lot of conversation around um, direct trade versus fair trade. Um, so really understanding what is, what is something that a third party is verifying the support of something versus what is something that's just a marketing claim um, that, that retailers or uh, brands are making. So it's kind of like the conversation around, um, is, it, is it natural as a product, as a food product, or is it certified organic? You know, we have a lot more faith and comfort in uh, ensuring that what we're sourcing is certified organic. So I just kind of wanted to touch on from a business perspective, some of the key functions of certifications. So I have a sample of a sampling of different certifications up here. Um, and I think the key, the key thing to think about from a business perspective is that you have that third party verification. Um, it ensures traceability, whether it's all the way from um, source produced all the way to retail or shelf. Um, there's tracking of, of financials, so who paid whom for which product, um, and then there's auditing standards. So all of these certifications have a strict um, uh, checklist, so to say, of what they're auditing the supply chain for to ensure that they're backing up those claims that we're saying to consumers. Um, I think another really big thing to touch on with certification is that a lot of these certifications are NGOs or nonprofits. Uh, but they're also working collaboratively in that space. So in terms of a fair trade um, USA or fair trade international, um, Rainforest Alliance with coffee, a lot of those organizations are then working with um, USAID or other groups that are seeking to support producers within their supply chain. Um, a lot of times too, from retailer and brand perspective, you know, perhaps something comes up that we shy away from, whether it's you know, child labor, um, whatever these kind of key uh, factors that pop up within our supply chains that businesses, you know, kind of run away from telling the truth of, of what's kind of going on. So, um, you know, a, a third party certification can help verify with that. And I think one of the, one of the key factors is also um, working collaboratively with these NGOs and with these certification organizations. You know, nothing is black and white and nothing is um, an absolute, uh, determination, you know, everything is kind of a work in progress. So the more effort that we put into supporting our certifications and supporting these NGOs, we're actually looking to kind of increase support within the supply chains. Um, another big fun function of that is that a lot of these certification organizations work with businesses and work with foundations to do some leveraged funding projects. Um, you know, when I was working with Fair Trade USA, there were a lot of uh, coffee origin projects that we were working on, whether it was um, housing or scholarships, you know, but really trying to work on how do we drive more incentive um, and more support back to the producers that are, are creating the, the products that we're selling. Um, and then I think, you know, just 
the, the inherent bit of navigating supply chain risk. So when you're looking at third party certifications, there's a lot of things that you can, you know, whether it's making sure that you have access to supply later um, in terms of thinking about climate change and what certifications work towards ensuring that, um, you know, the producers are being supported in their in their how they're putting into growth or perhaps it could be something along the lines of um, looking for auditing data on trying to find non-conformance of um, different uh, fertilizers that are being used. So you know where within your supply chain to start looking if there's you know talk of Roundup that's coming in. So all different ways to kind of like navigate that supply chain risk as a business. Um, and like I said before, I think it's, it's multi-factor faceted on thinking of, you know, there's the brand certification and, and the, the manufacturer working directly with these certifying bodies for their supply chain, but also for retailers, you know, certifications can be a great entry into how they start telling their sustainability story. You know, by making those decisions when they're purchasing, you, know, you start to look at it a little bit differently. So in my current role with sourcing with bakery, um, you know, a lot of things that I look at is I create vendor scorecards and I analyze what what my business partners are doing, working on packaging. How are they seeking to give back to the environment? Um, what are those key decisions that I can make with purchases in my supply chain to sell to consumers that also help um, you know, sustainability goals as a company? So I think there's a, a, a multifaceted way of kind of looking at certifications and how they support supply chains. Um, so that's just kind of a brief overview, and then I'll pass it off to my peer, Catherine, to kind of touch on um, the Chicago Fair Trade perspective. Renee, really quick before we hand it off, we do have a question from yes. a participant wondering if the B Corp certification is similar to these that you have mentioned here on the slide or how it, how it differs, if you could speak to that a bit. Sure. Um, so B Corp is going to be a little different than what I have um, posted on this slide. So B Corp is going to look at overall business. Um, so they have an auditing process. Um, you can actually go to their website and you can start kind of self auditing your business. I did that in grad school for a couple of organizations that I work with. But just to look at your business um, in, circular, in circularity and as a whole. Um, the other great thing about B Corp, you know, you, it's kind of a rating system. Um, it's very collaborative. I've heard that their um, support for businesses from different partners that I've worked with is amazing, that it's a very um, collaborative network of resources of businesses that are trying to work for good. So they, they very often um, host a lot of really great seminars for their business partners and seek to grow relationships from business to business, which I think, um, is a great thing about certification. Fair trade does that as well. You know, how do we take the the best best of and our best practices and share that with others to promote that benefit? Um, so, like I said, you know, a lot of these things that I have up on here, whether it's FSC or Rainforest Alliance, those are looking at um, commodities and ingredients within the supply chain, and B Corp is looking at the business as a whole. So it could even have to do with you know the building that you're running out of, how your sales supply chain works, how you work with your labor within your business, whether it's retail sales or manufacturing. Um, so B Corp to me looks at, you know, kind of big broad business at a higher level than these commodity views. Right. Um, I'll take over Renee, can you stop sharing your screen please? And I will share mine. So. Hello, yeah, I'm, I'm, as they said before, I'm Catherine Bissell Cordova, um, or I guess I said that before. <laughs> and I am director of Chicago Fair Trade. Um, we love B Corp, we partner with B Corp. Um, let me try to figure out how do I go back here one sec. Okay, here we go. So yeah, so I'm director of Chicago Fair Trade. We are an organization that was founded in, uh, originally in 2000 and, um, five as a project of Oxfam, which is the uh, international anti-poverty organization that had done a whole lot of work with fair trade uh, in Europe over the years where it's very commonplace. Um, but even then, not that long ago, I mean, fair trade here in the United States as a movement is really quite new. Um, and it was really nice to hear you, Erica, speaking and, you know, you, Renee, speaking, but now, you know, what what we really did in the beginning was just getting people to stop and think at all about their purchasing power, um, which was really kind of 
something people didn't talk about or think about much, even just 15 years ago, and it's really exploded. Um, and when they did, then, you know, the farm to table movement became big and people did talk a lot about sustainability, but really left out the labor piece a lot. And that always just drove me crazy. I come from a human rights, worker rights background. Um, but now it's come along so much more people's concept of what sustainability means and knowing that it means, you know, aside from the environmental piece, the labor piece. Um, so what we do at Chicago Fair Trade, um, our tagline is to educate, activate, and celebrate. Um, our, ah, why isn't this working? There we go. There you see our um, mission statement. And we really, I'm not gonna read it to you, I, I, you guys can read, but um, when you say about cultivating a community, that's where we really are strongest. We're really good at bringing people together who share these same values that are looking through these seals and, and certifications um, to, and people come at it from different angles. Some people come at it because they're very interested. Like I just said, I was like, the, the labor right piece was really important to me. It's all important to me, but that's what brought me into fair trade. Others come at it from an environmental angle. Um, others come from it from an anti-trafficking angle, but we bring all these people together and build community. Um, and really try to to make it a living, breathing thing and not, I mean, it, it, the seal is very important to look for certification, but it's so much more than that. It's really creating a community based on the values that those seals represent. So here you see some examples back pre-COVID when we would have lots of different gatherings or even a fair trade dinner party with fair trade certified food products and fair trade um, tabletop. You know, we also do a lot around clothing because there is such problem with fast fashion and now ultra fast fashion and, and people buying four times as many clothes as they did 20 years ago that end up in landfill made by people pay too little. So we had a mending circle here at one of our business members here. We had a nice happy hour that we used to do quite often. Um, another thing that we've always really focused on too, we're, we really see ourselves as building a movement um, and really leading a movement here in the US, here in Chicago Fair Trade, we're the biggest fair, grassroots fair trade coalition in the US. Um, and so we've really always focused on youth leadership because we need to bring youth into a movement if you want to ensure the future of a movement and make sure it's sustainable. And also, you know, a lot of times to students too, they're, they don't have a lot of money yet, but they're just, uh, you know, we work with high school and college students, but really showing them too, like you're, you're being, uh, pitched your whole life to become a consumer and what kind of consumer do you want to be? And if you're going to go into business, what kind of business do you, do you want to run? So we, we work a lot with high school students here on the left there. That's um, Whitney Young High School, which is Michelle Obama's alma mater. It's a big deal school here in Chicago. And uh, we partnered with them to make them a fair trade school, which means they source fair trade products. They teach fair trade in their curriculum and do fair trade activities. And there they were at fair trade campaigns, which is a national organization um, presenting on the main stage about how you could be a fair trade school. Um, while doing all of this, we like to have fun too, because um, fair trade is an alternative to a lot, you know, it, it combats a lot of problems. It combats um, poverty wages, it combats child labor and, and slavery, forced labor. But it there there is an alternative, which are these fair trade cooperatives, fair trade um, groups that we all can support and, and, and have fun and be joyous in doing so. Um, so fair trade also leads itself to a lot of great ways to bring people together. In February, we always do talk about chocolate and how important it is to look for a certification in, when you're buying chocolate, and especially in a field where there's so much child labor involved in the cacao industry. In April, we focus on fashion. Um, fashion Revolution is uh, recognized and, and there are activities in the last week of April. It was, we just finished uh, Fashion Revolution and that is to commemorate the lives of 1,138 Bangladeshi garment workers who were killed in the worst industrial accident of this century um, on April 24th, 2013. So we bring together students, we have a fashion show, um, workshops, all sorts of different events. Uh, this Saturday, May 8th is World Fair Trade Day. It's always the second Saturday of May. It's the day before Mother's Day. 
Um, and every year we do a big event. We do the biggest one in the US here in Chicago. This is something where we're, we're we, for many years, we're right in the center of downtown. You see on the bottom right hand, there's normally a farmer's market and we take over and sell all fair trade products there are different business members. We have 60 locally, 60 locally owned businesses who sell fair trade products. They're there selling, um, handing out fair trade bananas. You always have someone who wants to wear the banana suit. Um, we moved it a couple of years ago over to Michigan Avenue, which in Chicago is kind of the epicenter of consumerism. There's a lot of big box stores, a lot of very anti fair trade, non-certified products being sold. But so we thought let's bring it right there and really reach consumers where they are shopping. And, um, and have done events there as well. And we pop up throughout the city, throughout the year, talking to youth, talking to anyone, selling fair trade products, talking fair trade, and kind of our signature big event. I've been executive director since 2014. And that first year I did it, I said, let's do a pop-up shop. And um, sadly in, in Chicago that we have a lot of fair trade businesses, but not a whole lot of, uh, we don't have a full dedicated fair trade store right now in Chicago. It's harder in the bigger cities. But so we popped up and we invited our business members to participate. Um, we just did it this year in spite of COVID. As you'll see here, we used our, we always use it as a chance to, to educate folks here on our little sticker saying stand six feet apart. We have all the fair trade um, principles um, behind the labels and certifications. Um, right now, we are doing a three-week, three-part long challenge. Um, you can go to our website, which I'll list at the end, but where we've got resources there. We're working with a lot of high school students where, you know, under the Educate, you can click on links. These are all hyperlinked to different podcasts, uh, films, TV shows. There's also petitions to support fair trade campaigns that are going on to support workers that are, you know, fair trade. Um, and to celebrate, because we always have to celebrate all of this. Um, oh, I had put another slide in there. Here you go. But one thing that Renee said, and that really um, struck me too, in talking about certification, we had this event as part of our World Fair Trade Day three-week challenge. This was an event people could attend. Renee um, met this woman, Fatima Ismael, who is a leader of a large fair trade coffee uh, cooperative in Nicaragua. And we were talking to her and saying, what, what do you want us to tell consumers about, you know, looking for the seal and the fair trade seal and why, you know, we hear a lot about direct trade coffee right now. Um, can you tell us from a coffee farmer perspective, what, you know, the difference? And she said, you know, was something uh, that Renee touched upon that, you know, some, some people, some, I'm not trying to bash everyone who's saying they're direct trade because some of them are treating the farmers well, but it's their word um, versus a third party certified um, product. And, and Fatima did not think very highly of the direct trade. She said a lot of people are just taking that term and running with it and they don't pay a fair trade premium, which is something where when you buy a pound of fair trade coffee with a seal on it, in addition to the farmers getting a fair wage, they get a 20 cent per pound social premium that they use, that they, uh, the cooperative democratically votes on what to use those those funds for and they go from anything from child care to school uniforms to health clinics to all sorts of things so um anyhow it's it, we, we're just always telling everyone how important it is to look for the seal um how you can live your values through it and um yeah so support the current kind of world you'd like to live in unmute myself. <laughs> Catherine, thanks so much. And thank you, Renee. Those were great. Um, we're going to transition into the uh, discussion and Q&A portion of this session. So again, attendees, if you guys have questions for panelists, please put them in the chat. Uh, we do have one question that came in while we were presenting. And, and this sort of goes along with uh, something that we've all sort of touched upon is, um, and this is for both Renee and Catherine, you know, a lot of uh, consumers are confused by certification. Some of it is marketing. Some of it are actual certifications. How do people kind of like wade through the waters on what are fake, what are real, what's just a marketing ploy to get you to buy the product, sort of what, you know, how do you guys help people kind of navigate through that? Mm -hmm. I can touch on that to start. You know, I think yeah. especially within the coffee industry, that's a really big thing and food in general. Um, you know, there's a lot with, like I had mentioned earlier, saying that something is all natural, you know, what, what does that even mean? You know, saying that something, um, you know, 
I guess for me, the biggest key is for education, education on part of um, the businesses and the consumers to really teach what the seals are and what they mean. Um, I think even the, the third party certification organizations um, kind of owe it to consumers to make that seal recognizable. Um, it also drives the value back to the business. Um, so I guess for me, that's the biggest answer is really learning to understand all of the seals, which is a lot for consumers. I think we get into seal and lo logo overload, um, but recognizing that just calling something out as um, natural or direct trade is very different than fair trade or non-GMO, so to say. So really just consumer and education. Yeah, and that's, that's we, we do do a lot of that and we are asked a lot, um, that a lot. But yeah, I mean, we I always will say, you know, look, look for a seal, any sort of seal is better than none. Um, make, you know, see if it's, yes, just their own claims and their own made up name for something, or if it's like a network of, of you know, a recognized seal that's a third party um, certifier, which Renee and I have referenced, both have referenced, but that's, you know, meaning it's not just your own claim, it's, it's verifiable by an audit. Um, so so the, the, those are the main things that we tell people. Um, I also will say, you know, we work a lot with art with people doing more makers products, not necessarily food products. And so a lot of them are not fair trade certified, but there's also the Fair Trade Federation, which is uh, 270 business members um, in Canada and the United States. And they're a membership organization and they vet very heavily. I mean, they, and they're saying like Renee was saying before too, is like kind of like with B Corp, it's like the whole business is, is uh, committed to the principles of fair trade. It's not like the product itself gets the seal, like we've been talking about, but the whole organization is a member of a network. And so I, you know, if I am at a street fair and I see someone and they'll say fair trade and I'll say, oh, are you part of any fair trade network? And if they say no, I mean, I'm not there to be the fair trade police, but I'll think, well, that's weird because a principle of fair trade is promote fair trade. And so most fair, our fair trade business members, they want to be involved with fair trade networks. They know each other. They're members of our organization. Many of them are members of fair trade federation. So just digging a little bit and asking that even um, if you're a part of <laughs> something of, of a network. And we've got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, if people want to learn more about certifications, do you either have apps they can download, websites they can visit? Like, where can people learn more about certifications and what they mean? Well, I would probably start with the Sustainability Consortium there, Erica. I think that would be a great resource. Um, you know, I, I've seen a couple of different apps pop up. There was a, a Too Good To Go or something for a little while. There's been several that have popped up. Um, I, I don't know of any currently off the top of my head, but if there are any that are active, um, I would also just look to your, for me, like the biggest start is looking within retailers and really looking at what you see on packaging um, and, and um, kind of diving in from there. Uh, trade magazines, which if you know if you're a specific uh, business member or if you're involved in a certain industry, I would definitely go straight to the where that where that starts. So um, you know, in coffee, there's a very tight knit coffee community. Um, you know, clothing, whatever your kind of industry of choices, so that would be kind of my start. Great, and I would say just to add to that, you know, I think as a buyer, as a person who buys things, it's good to know what you truly care about and understand the certifications in that area. So I think Catherine, you had mentioned that caring about labor rights sort of brought you to fair trade. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. uh, going back to my wild caught seafood example that I showed before, um, many people go into the grocery store and they want to buy wild caught salmon. It like looks pretty. And it, you, in your mind, you're like, oh, the salmon are like living their best life in these streams mm -hmm. and they're happy and I'm eating them and I'm happy. But there's actually a lot of potential sustainability issues with wild caught salmon that are not uh, present in farm raised salmon, which most people don't want to potentially purchase farm raised salmon because in their mind, these salmon aren't out in the wild. But if you care about child labor on these shipping vessels, if you care about fair labor, uh, farm raised seafood sometimes might be an option for you. So it's really about understanding what is important to you and what certifications are around that and really understanding them and looking for them. 
So another question we have coming in, this is an interesting one. So for students interested in going into a career in sustainable supply chains, uh, what positions might they consider targeting out of college? So I know ASU has a big sustainability program. You know, Renee and Catherine, where do you think people should look if they want to get into the kind of work that you guys both do? Um, there's so many places to start. And I, everybody that I know has had a different pathway that brought them to sustainability, um, especially as a career. So uh, my graduate degree is from ASU um, in their sustainability department. Um, so I, for me, it's starting to network within your school and try to understand where are connections, whether it's, um, you know, different teachers that are working uh, in the in the school that you're already in, whether it's a business school um, and finding internships that way. Um, another good step into understanding more about sustainability within supply chains is just to start working within retailers and manufacturers in supply chain. Um, you know, I think the way that the world is growing right now and with consumers having such an interest in holding their businesses such, so accountable to having sustainability um, as a, a mission and a value for the company, um, sometimes you can make a bigger ripple or a bigger wave in the water by going into an organization that maybe isn't viewed, viewed as sustainable and trying to bring in some of the, the values and beliefs in there. So I think that there's multiple approaches. Um, you know. Right now I'm sourcing for a bakery department. So you would think that, okay, I work for a, a grocer that puts a lot of emphasis on organic and natural and, and all these things. So we are sustainable, but you know, how do you look at bakery? So it's understanding what can you do within your role? So it's sourcing different vendors. It's really understanding the supply chain that you're in. So I think there's so many different avenues on how to approach that. Yeah, and I mean, one thing you said, and I'm sure you you all know this. I, yeah, I don't. I'm I'm no more people that have opened fair trade businesses, um, but but yeah, I mean, there, there's just going to be more and more of them. I mean, it, it's 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 been interesting for us to see. You know, a couple of years ago, people weren't talking about supply chain the way they are with COVID, and so a lot of these issues that we've been talking about for years are suddenly front and center and on people's mind and on consumers' mind and on. So I I like to think it's a it's a good time to that there'll be more and more jobs in the field moving forward. Yeah, and I just have to say, I did not have a background in sustainability before I uh, took this current job that I've been in for five years. So don't let that stop you. If you have a passion for it, um, you know, pursue it, you know, even if you don't have a degree in sustainability. So it'll pay off for you. Um, lots of questions coming in. Catherine, this one is for you. Um, let me find it. Are there any good incentives for customers to buy fair trade? Um, incentives. I mean, I think, do you mean just like per, I mean, I think, I think people feel wonderful when they buy fair trade. I mean, I, it's, it's funny cause we, you know, so we have this pop-up shop and it, you know, we get people that would drive two hours just to shop there cause they're only want to buy fair trade, but most people are just, we don't have them in high foot traffic areas and most of them, a lot of them just really never had thought about it. We were actually... <laughs> right next door to an outlet of a big box store that I won't name, but you know, and they'd come in with their shopping bags and then, you know, kind of look around and see. So, I mean, and I, but I, I, people thank us, con like thank, like I've never, I haven't worked retail except in fair trade, but I don't think this is the case always. I mean, more and more people, they're just thanking us for being there. And feel, I mean, so I just think people, I, I mean, I'm an optimist and I think like most people do, want to do some good. They're happy when they realize that their they're spending dollars can go to good. But, and though it's getting more uh, well known, you know, the, the these terms, fair trade and sustainability and all this, it's still, we have a long way to go. So I think there's still a lot of people that are just getting to the point when they're starting to even like a light bulbs going on when they're realizing that they can even um, be a part of this. I don't know if I really answered the question. But <laughs> well, there is a second part to it that's sort of, you know, what are the effective methods of educating customers on certification? So, you know, Renee from Fresh Time Market to, you know, Chicago for Trade, sort of what are the best ways that you guys are educating your customers, whether they're consumers or suppliers, you know, on these certifications? 
Um, I have 10 years in uh, grocery retailers with another large organic market. So I worked for Whole Foods on and off for 10 years. Um, but for me, I think the biggest thing is starting with team members and starting with employees and, and management um, and those people that are on the front line with customer service, um, you know, especially working within uh, coffee supply chain, you know, the more that I got team members and employees excited about what was different about their coffee and, and where coffee comes from, um, then the more they started having that conversation with customers. So I think that that's really person to person um, conversation is really important. You know, I was a store manager for a while and you would be amazed at how many people are so frustrated that they got, you know, terrible oranges at, at this time of year, awful strawberries and you know, you just kind of even mentioned that how far they've come from a place that was filled with drought and, you know, just giving them the perspective of their supply chain and eyes open up. So I, for me, it's it's word of mouth and really just starting to get people to understand where things come from and how they get to you. Yeah, and same same with us. And I mean, we do a lot of, you know, I think I said, I know I don't turn down an opportunity to come talk, but, you know, we, we do a lot of, you know, teaching and high schools and, you know, working some too on getting curriculum to different teachers so that it's just become so, something that kids are taught. Because right now in England, we're fair trade. I think it's one in every three bananas sold in England is fair trade. Um, that they are taught about fair trade in high school, every student. So they know it, so they look for it. So that's, I mean, we're always pushing to teach more and more and we're, um, well, I'm not allowed to say this yet, but you guys don't live in Chicago, Renee. I don't know if I told this is on the down low, but we have a activist member teacher and she's actually working on it. It's looking like her, all the ninth graders in Chicago public schools are gonna be receiving 14 paragraphs on fair trade and what it means starting next year, which is huge for us. So, so yeah, we just go about it, teaching people about it. Great, it helps to start all the way from the beginning like that, so. Um, uh, another question that came in, so, you know, we've all been talking a lot about, um, you know, things that grow in the ground, you know, natural commodities. What about traceability and certifications, if either of you can answer, for things like synthetic fibers or plastics? Um, do you guys have any experience on sort of certifications in those areas, why it's important to understand the transparency supply chains for those particular products rather than seafood and bananas and flour and those things that we've been talking about? I have some experience with um, conversations around those. So working with um, beverage companies on their source for tin and really up starting to dive into understanding minerals. Um, and then I have worked on a couple of um, projects with packaging and recyclable materials within plastics, less from the sourcing side and, and more from the um, the output side or, you know, can they be recycled? Are they already made from recycled materials? Um, I think for me, it's really looking at your business as a whole and really understanding um, the circular economy and doing a lifestyle analysis on your, on your business. Um, and then understanding the implications of things. So, you know, you mentioned plastics and I don't know a ton about sourcing plastics, um, but for me, it's a lot more with minerals and tin. Um, and, and where those come from and mining. And I know that there's a lot of movements um, at GreenBiz. I was having a conversation with someone that works at, in the mining industry on how do they apply some of other certifications principles to mining. Um, so there's a lot of cross collaboration across industries to kind of start broadening those conversations. I don't know if that helps, but. I don't, I don't know much about that. There. Yeah. About important one to think about. Um, okay, another question in for Renee. So how does your group determine sort of what companies to help? And are they mainly coming to you? Or are you sort of seeking them out? Um, so in my current role with working for Fresh Time in category management, um, you know, I'm being, I get emails, I get packages, I get phone calls with everyone that wants to bring me their next product. Um, so the first place that I start with any of those is really understanding um, kind of a, a basic rating on their business and just starting to ask those questions. Um, then there are some that I seek out. If, you know, um, for example, I found a waffle recently that I saw featured on an Oprah um, 
blog, you know, and, and I found out that this organization did great things and they were gluten-free certified. And I immediately reached out to the company of the waffle and said, Hey, are you in retailers? I want to, I want to get you in, please let me be your first. Um, so I think it goes both ways. And then, you know, kind of from the certification side of it, you know, businesses frequently come to the certification, but then also producers um, come to the certification side. So I know Erica touched on um, seafood, you know, that's another industry that um, a lot of fish, fishing communities sought out to become fair trade certified before fair trade certification of fishing communities was a thing. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth, whether it's driven from the business and consumer side or driven from needs from the producer side. And Catherine, um, what is the role of NGOs and nonprofits to sort of drive more sustainable business? Well, I think you're, you're muted. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I personally think it's important um, kind of, I mean, that's kind of our, our whole existence of just, um, because I mean, I don't know if I'm going to answer this very well, but I mean, I, I think, as I said, like we're starting a movement, you know, so it's beyond, I mean, if you just have brands saying there's this, that's good, but I mean, we're, it's really making people feel connected. It's making people have more of an impact by us working collectively and us working collectively too, you know, with an NGO. Um, it's important that people individually think about their consumption but we as an organization, that's how you get first people to think about it. Like, what are, what are you consuming? What could you change? And, always, and it's always incremental as you, you know, like you said, pick the one issue that brought you to it or, you know, really dive down on one thing. I often say to people like, pick one product in your life, like that you will switch over. You can't do it all overnight necessarily, but pick one product. But then we push people beyond that. Like what institutions are you involved with? For example, you know, ASU is a fair trade university, right? But I mean, where, you know, where can you collectively? And so that's why I think it's important for, for um, NGOs, nonprofits to be part of this, to bring, to, to create the movement, because that's not really something I don't think that brands are gonna do. Great and so the other side of that coin, Renee. You know, what are how can retailers, you know, effectively use certifications to set their sustainability goals? Sort of, how do they help in that? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that it depends on how what what level of business you're looking at. You know, so to kind of answer this from my re, with my retailer hat on, you know, if I'm a retailer, I, you know, I start with where I'm sourcing sourcing products from. So. You know, by reviewing some of these certifications and looking at what they stand for and starting to look for products that carry those seals, you know, I'm starting to then speak to the mission and the values of myself as a retailer and what I'm choosing to, you know, represent in the world. Um, it also gives a way to start, uh, you know, measuring KPIs and measuring impact. So, you know, if you look at, um, for example, private label coffee is being sourced from somewhere. So the retailer can then look at what is the volume of, of fair trade coffee that they're buying that's certified and how many people's lives are that affecting and start to really start to have those KPIs. Um, and then I think for, you know, for those brands that are relying on that, you know, it gives them a the traceability of looking at their supply chain and really understanding um, where things come from and, and how they're sourced and how they give back to the community. But you know, there's also kind of this, this piece of values behind most of the certifications. So I think by choosing which certification you start with as a business, you know, you're really speaking to what your business goals within sustainability are. So maybe it's certain SDGs or, you know, um, sustainability, sustainable development goals that you're looking to support. Um, so really trying to align what are these certifications again, and then how do you use your business to, to go through it? Great, we probably have just a minute left for us all to kind of leave a closing thought. Um, Catherine, any closing thoughts based on all we've discussed that everybody in attendance should really take away thinking about certifications? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, you're not, it, you, they can be confusing. There's a lot of them, pick one, learn about that one, pick another one, you know, don't, um, or as I like, you know, pick, pick the issue that matters most to you. Or, or pick one product, just start somewhere. It's incremental, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's, um, but it's the future, so way to go. Renee, any closing thoughts on certification? Yeah, I 
I think just from the business perspective, um, again, you know, start small and figure out where, where do you begin? You know, I think, um, Erica, you touched on this in your opening. It's so easy to get overwhelmed as a business when you're trying to make decisions on where you even start with sustainability. Um, I, I also suggest, you know, look from within, look at your own, your own four walls and your employees and, and really start to understand how are you guiding your business through your own labor practices, diversity, um, and, and start from the ground up and, and just look to make better, better decisions as a business. I think the more that we get behind those and the more of our stories that we tell for as businesses, you know, the more that we just grow the movements. Yeah, that's great. It seems like the theme running through all of this is really, um, you know, educate yourself on what's out there, what certifications are out there. I can't tell you working in sustainability, I get a text daily from someone that's like, can I recycle this? Like, literally, they text me every single day. Um, and most of the time, the answer is no. But it's really good. Like, do, do your research, you know, working in marketing communication in 2019, I probably got three calls a week from reporters asking us to comment on the straws. Um, and that was a big deal. If you all remember the straws, there's still a big deal. And straws are a big deal, but there may be bigger deals in the plastics world. And, you know, really um, educate yourself, understand the sustainability issues, figure out what you care about and what companies are doing to support, you know, those issues and, and purchase from those companies and stop purchasing from the ones that don't, they will notice, I promise you. Yeah, uh, I, think I want to think... Oh, Renee, go ahead. Oh, no, I just, you, what you just said, just really the straw, straws comment, you know, I think that nothing can be valued more than really doing a, a, a life cycle analysis of your business and looking at it holistically, you know, consumer perception may be that the straw is the worst thing in the world for the business when you look at a materiality study and, and the full business and you might find out that it's, you can make more of a impact by just having something made out of recycled paper. You know, you never know what those benefits and, and rewards are until you really dive into that and have some support with that through third party. Or you may find the new plastic lid that replaces the straw uses more plastic. You know, yeah. you never know what you're going to find when you <laughs> research. So um, we could do a whole uh, webinar on straws. So yeah. Catherine and Renee, I just want to thank you both. Um, great and super valuable perspectives and uh, thank ASU for letting us hold this webinar and uh, we'll turn it back over to Emma. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you all for joining us today and a special thank you to Erica, Renee and Catherine for that very informative and engaging discussion. I certainly appreciate it. Our next installment in the Sustainable Earth webinar series is on Tuesday, July 13th at 10 a.m. Arizona time. So mark your calendars and be on the lookout for that next invitation to your email. In the meantime, you can visit sustainable-earth.org to discover how you can advance sustainability where you live, work, and play. So on the portal, when you get there, you can find items such as lesson plans, sustainable innovations, and you actually have also have access to free custom curated courses specifically for Sustainable Earth visitors, where you can earn a micro-credential in various sustainability topics such as circular economy, sustainable supply chains, and sustainability reporting. So we hope you found value not only from today's discussion, but also in what Sustainable Earth is doing and hope it further inspires you to take action in your neighborhood. We hope you all have a great rest of your week and we look forward to seeing you at the next Sustainable Earth webinar series on Tuesday, July 13th. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>